It has been a long 18 months of a lot of people working from home and living and working together 24 seven. And our next guest is going to talk about what that really means in the terms of abuse and violence in the home and domestic altercations. And while it's a very unfortunate topic, it's a very timely topic. I'd like to welcome Maricela Rios Faust, the CEO of Human Options. Human Options started in 1981 and now four decades later is an Orange County wide initiative. So welcome Maricela, thank you for coming to share with us today. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you for having me on with you this morning. My pleasure. So please tell us a little bit about the history of Human Options. Sure. Um, happy to. So for about 40 years ago, Human Options was started. Um, our founding executive director um, started it out of the trunk of her car is the way that we tell the story. She um, got together with three other incredible women and had started to notice um, some trends in women in Orange County. And those trends were really around deep anxiety and depression. Um, and they sought to really understand where that was coming from. And so they went door to door and interviewed women and found that many of the women that had anxiety and depression had it as a result of being afraid in their own home. Um, and from that, Human Options was born. Human Options was really set up to respond to the need uh, of survivors in the community who had no access and no support. And probably very little awareness. That it's an amazing initiative to go door to door to actually learn these things. Why, why is there such a prevalence of relationship violence? Sure. Um, you know, that's a, that's a great question. Over time, um, you know, our 40 year history, what we've learned is that the prevalence exists because nobody's talking about domestic violence. It's one of the, um, it's very well known, well hidden secret, I would say. So, you know, it's something that when you start to talk about it, everybody shies away. Um, Human Options has begun to really talk about it in terms of relationship violence, because what we understand is when we say domestic violence, Almost everyone listening can say, oh, I know what that is, and either tune you out um, or the experience with domestic violence is so intense that they can't really have a conversation around it because of some other experience. So as we've talked about relationship violence, we've found that it really begins to open up a dialogue and understanding where very few people um, understand it in its complexity. Um, so it allows us to shine a light and raising awareness is really about that. It's about not only talking about the issue, but having people understand how it shows up on a day-to-day -day basis. So let's talk about that. In my intro, I talked about how this has become a much bigger conversation through this COVID pandemic, mostly because it sent so many of us back into the home, but talk to us about how it's manifested now. I mean, because now it is an open conversation. So what do the numbers look like? What are the things that you're discovering? How can we know mm -hmm. if someone is, is having that experience and whether they know it or not, or someone that they know, whether it's happening to them or someone they know? Yeah, um, you know, it, it's so true. Uh, it is a conversation that more people are willing to have today and more people are seeking to understand. Um, what happened when um, about a year and a half ago, when everybody was um, encouraged to stay home and asked to stay home for their safety, is we recognized right away that that was creating an added risk for survivors in homes that were already abusive. Um, and so really trying to understand um, how do we get, get information to survivors who need that window of time to be able to flee when there's abuse really intensely um, so that they can get the access to support that they needed. We found that abusers were using um, the shutdown orders as a reason to keep the, the abused woman or child or, or man um, really kind of confined to their home. So really saying, well, you can't go out there because you're gonna risk um, right, getting sick. You're gonna risk catching COVID. They're never gonna take care of you the way that I do. Um, but it also created an opportunity for us as an organization to begin to help people understand what it must be like to be afraid in your own home, to not have safety and security. Um, our numbers really in the first few months of the pandemic doubled. Um, we saw people trying to access our hotline and more importantly, trying to access legal, legal resources uh, for the reasons I mentioned before, which was really having the abuser use custody as a way of keeping control of the, of the abused woman. 
Um, having them say, well, if you go to this environment, I'm going to take the kids away. So it was always some manipulation of the system and really act, trying to understand what their rights were during this time was something that was critically important. Um, another thing we saw is the intensity of abuse escalated. So where we would normally see, I'd say in a given year, 10 to 15% cases that were strangulation, where um, there was a woman who maybe came in and shared, this is what he, you know, he held me by the neck or he threw me against the wall and held, held my, my throat. Um, we were seeing that exponentially grow within the first six months where we were having about 50% of the women that were coming into the emergency shelter report at that point, um, strangulation, which is pretty high, um, given that that's usually something that's minimized um, by the person that's being abused. So in that case, the abuse is physical. Is abuse always physical? It's, uh, that's a really great question, Lauren. It's not always physical. There's um, abuse actually generally starts with um, some kind of manipulation or control. So it's verbal. Um, it's something around like, well, why are you wearing that outfit? Right? Um, why are you talking to that friend of yours? She doesn't like me. She's trying to set a bad example for you. She's trying to influence you. Um, oh, I don't like you talking to other men. It makes me it makes me uncomfortable. So it starts with the manipulation and control of the individual. Um, verbal, it's psychological. It's really saying, you know, um, you're not that smart. Why, why did you do that? That's so stupid. And making comments like that and gradually will grow to abuse. Very few cases start with um, the abuser um, actually physically assaulting the woman or the man in their for, on their first date. It's a gradual sort of increase and in escalation. Um, and it's all about power and control. It's all about removing social support from the victim. Um, and then making them 100% dependent on the abuser. So the other type of abuse that I know we hear about, but I don't know how much the conversation has really turned there is elder abuse. Right. And as someone who literally, because of COVID, moved across the country to care for my octogenarian parents, this is a topic that has come up a lot more for me. Can you talk mm -hmm. about how that's... Um, recognizable and what can be done about it, how to know it's happening or not? Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a great question. So for, for, what, uh, for human options, what we have known for a long time is that the abuse, um, in particular in an abusive marriage or relationship does not end when you become a senior. Um, and in a lot of cases, maybe it subsides or maybe it's become less intense. Um, but what we're finding more and more is that the adult child actually then takes steps in as the abuser. Uh, we find cases where maybe um, for economic reasons, the adult children have had to move back into the home and they began to control the finances or they began to, um, you know, move the adult, the, the senior into the garage. We actually had a case where adult children moved back at home. Um, their mom had been abused for years with by their father. Their father finally pa uh, passed away um, and then they moved back in and moved mom into the garage. And they were basically taking her social security checks and using her finances in addition to maltreatment, right? Um, and those are instances in which um, it's something that they saw. Um, it's not, I mean, not, not every adult child does that, but if they've grown up in a home where abuse is tolerated or mom's been abused or dad's been abused, um, that is likely to be replicated. And we find that quite often. So talk to me about the services that you you human options offer mm -hmm. to survivors? Sure. Um, so human options um, has really prided itself in offering comprehensive services to survivors. We recognize that for many, emergency shelter is the right place to go. And it's something that helps you stop the abuse immediately and create safety. We also recognize that for many, being in an emergency shelter can Come with stigma. Um, it may not be the right location for many. And so we have a continuum of housing resources where we can help put people rapidly back in their own home um, and provide wraparound services, which is counseling, legal advocacy, and case management to make sure they're able to get back on their feet. Um, and then we can also put somebody if they, for, for, for maybe the abuser um, did not allow them to work. And so they have no technical job skills, and they need a little bit of time to develop that, we can offer transitional housing services. Um, we also find that at times survivors are stable and they've been able to flee and either live with a family member or connect with a friend again. 
Um, but they, what they really need is um, to be able to work through their trauma. So we also offer um, counseling services, psychoeducational groups. You know, sometimes it's important to understand how the dynamic happened. It's important to understand it's not your fault. Um, and so we offer the opportunity to really learn about those and empower the survivor to be able to take the next steps that are right for them. Um, and then, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, how can people learn more? How can they get involved or donate or or support you in your mission? Yeah. Um, so a couple of things. I, I do want to uh, take a minute and share the hotline number because I think it's important whenever somebody's listening to have that accessible. So our hotline number is 877-854-3594. Again, 877-854-3594. Um, and that's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, getting involved with the organization, we always like to have volunteers who are interested in supporting the work that we do through a variety of different initiatives. You can go to the website at www.humanoptions.org. Again, www.humanoptions.org. Um, there are ways to get involved in our sisterhood program. There's ways to donate um, and support the organization and learn more about us. Um, and then we are always happy to explore options with anybody who would like at our um, as well. Excellent. So Maricela, thank you so much for sharing this information with us. We so deeply appreciate the work you're doing and the people that you're helping. And we'll put the hotline number and the website on the screen and also on the website, on our website when we post it so people can refer to it and find you easily. Thank yes. you for joining us today. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you for the opportunity. And we'll be right back.